Welcome to Signature Books, another event here with uh, four prestigious authors and another editor of another biography. These authors have all written biographies for Signature's brief biography series, which started last year, and we hope to have many, many more biographies of uh, Mormon and Mormon adjacent folks coming going forward. So I will introduce our four guests tonight. Um, and I'll do it in order of uh, chronology of when these uh, folks were born, the, the people that they wrote about. So I believe first was George Q. Cannon and Kenneth L. Cannon the, the second is the author of this book titled George Q. Cannon, Politician, Publisher, Apostle of Polygamy. Uh, Ken Cannon is an attorney practicing in Salt Lake City and has taught law at both the University of Utah and Brigham Young University's law schools and served as a Fulbright Scholar at the, on the University of Helsinki's Faculty of Law. He has written several essays on plural marriage and members of the Cannon family, among others. And George Q is your great-great-great-grandfather? Okay, great-great-grandfather. You look so young, I just thought it must have been another generation. One of, one of his younger wives, no <laughs> Polygamy. <laughs> okay, um, next is Constance Lieber, author of Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon, Suffragist, Senator, Plural Wife. Constance earned her PhD in Languages and Literature from the University of Utah. She taught German there and at Brigham Young University and currently job coaches Chinese speakers in writing English emails. That's another interesting topic we'll have to have her talk about sometime. She is also co-editor with John Silito of Letters from Exile, the correspondence of Martha Hughes Cannon and Angus M. Cannon, 1886 through 1889. And that is now available uh, through an ebook format uh, if, if any people are interested in that. Um, <coughs> Next is Gary Bergera. He is, uh, he was the editor of our biography on Harold B. Lee. He is here representing Newell Bringhurst, who is the author of that book. Newell lives in California, couldn't be with us tonight. Um, so Gary is the former uh, director of Signature Books and also of the Smith Pettit Foundation, and we're grateful to have his participation tonight. Next is Stephen Carter, author of Virginia Sorensen, Pioneering Mormon Historian. Author. Oh, Pioneering Mormon Author. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and Stephen Carter just recently, well, he, he won it again, I guess. <laughs> um, he was recently recognized by the Association for Mormon Letters for a, was it a lifetime? It was she, called Outstanding Contribution to Mormon Letters. There we go. Yes, during the recent 2023 conference. And he has also won the Association of Mormon Letters Award three times for his writings. Once for a personal essay, The Calling, another time for Eye Plates, Prophets, Priests, Rebels, and Kings, and finally for Signatures, Moth and Rust, Mormon Essays on Death. So he earned a PhD in Narrative Studies and is the Director of Publications for the Sunstone Education Foundation. Finally, we have Gary Topping, who earned his PhD at the University of Utah. He is the author of D. Michael Quinn, Mormon Historian, which he will discuss tonight. He is a retired archivist from Salt Lake Community College and the archives of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Salt Lake City. His other books include Glen Canyon and the San Juan Country, Utah Historians and the Re Reconstruction of Western History, and Leonard J. Arrington, A Historian's Life. Please join me in welcoming our guests here tonight. So we're going to start out by each of these biographers taking a few minutes just to explain their biography and, and the subject of that biography. So Ken, if you wanna go ahead and start. So um, this is an interesting thing and it, you know, it's a little bit, uh, I feel a little bit embarrassed when I write about people that I'm related to. Um, because A, they don't always come out that well, and B, uh, people expect me to be biased. And, and of course, my bias goes against my ancestors usually rather than in favor of them. Um, 
George Kagano was an interesting guy. He was a very controversial guy. On the one hand, a missionary of his when he was president of the European mission when he left said, I do not think it too much to say he was universally beloved. His kind, tender, unassuming disposition rendered him an object of affection. Wherever he went, whatever circumstances he was placed in, he gained friends. So that's kind of the Mormon side. He was held in high esteem. Um, then Eastern Press referred to him, detra who were detractors, it referred to him as the Mormon premier. Uh, C.C. Goodwin, when he was made editor of the Salt Lake Tribune, wrote a very interesting piece in which he called Cannon the, quote, sweetest, smoothest, and most possible sophist in all the round world. The Tribune also referred to him as the most vindictive and bloodthirsty of all the Mormon priesthood. <laughs> so you have, on the one hand, really happy ones, on the other hand, not so uh, happy. Um, he, he was an important guy in Mormon history. Writing this was really fun because from about 1860 on, following his life is really following the history of the church. He was in the center of it almost constantly. Sometimes he was directly uh, in the center of it. Um, he went on a mission to Sandwich Islands for three and a half years, uh, stayed there when most of the missionaries didn't, loved it, learned the language, translated the Book of Mormon into into Hawaiian and he and his confreres, there were five of them, baptized 4,000 people in three and a half years, most of them native Hawaiians. That got him on the radar for Brigham Young. Brigham Young sent him to, to San Francisco where he edited a newspaper, published his Book of Mormon and attracted a lot more attention. Uh, he was then called to be mission president in Europe um, where he drew even more attention, he came home, he was made an apostle, he was called on a special mission to improve public opinion of Mormons in the East. Um, and, and ultimately became Brigham Young's protege and displaced, interestingly enough, Heber C. Kimball. Heber C. Kimball once wrote, George Buchanan will, fly, will take off like a rocket and fall like a stick, only he never came back down. He kind of flew up as a rocket and never came back down. Anyway, he went on uh, all through the 70s. He was the territorial delegate to Congress from Utah, uh, prevented a lot of anti-polygamy stuff. He, he, he was just in the center. If, if you name an interesting piece of Mormon history from 1860 to 1900, he will almost certainly be in. Uh, weirdly enough, when he came home from Hawaii, he stopped in San Francisco where Parley P. Pratt was the mission president. Parley P. Pratt had George Q. Cannon, 25 years old, edit his autobiography. 400 pages of it. So, uh, interesting guy, big life, uh, controversial, uh, both in, in the church, out of the church. Uh, he, he made a lot of his uh, co-leaders mad. Um, uh, ultimately, they loved him. He made a lot of people outside the church really mad, but he also had a lot of friends uh, outside of the church. Um, and I'll say one more thing and I'll be done. Uh, Isabel, um, Beecher Hooker. So she's another one of the Beechers. Her, her sister was Harriet Beecher Stowe. Her brother was Henry Ward Beecher, two of the most important people in 19th century, late 19th century. W was in her own right, Isabel was in her own right, a big suffragist. And she loved something that George Buchanan was a big supporter of women's suffrage. And some of the anti-polygamy legislation uh, tried to take the right of women to vote away. And she loved what he said. And she sat next to him on a dais in, in Congress where he was serving and she turned to him and she said, uh, I tell all my friends, I would rather be your 50th wife than be the first wife of hundreds of men that I know, which I've always appreciated because this was a woman who did not like polygamy, but that's what she said. Uh, she, she was very taken uh, with him. So. That's a great quote. And Ken and I were, it was interesting what you're saying about like it's not an apologetic, an apologist, or a hagiography uh, book. Uh, was it last night you said that you liked him less after you started, after no, you more. wrote the book, or you wrote him? I didn't you didn't like, like him. him before, but liked him more by the time you were finished. I liked him okay, but I really, yeah, and there's there's reasons for that. But I, he turned out to be a very interesting. He was funny. I mean, you know, you can save a lot of things by being funny. I found an account in 1894 where he at a family party uh, went into an Irish ballad whose name it's like Falbrigg 
I don't remember what it is, but it's it's actually quite body. I mean, he's a member of the First Presidency and he had the family thing saying this body Irish ballad uh, for everyone to say, nobody else to see me other than family, I can do this anyway. Mm -hmm. And he did, he was, he was a fun guy. Interesting. Okay, so now let's move to our next biography. And you may have already noticed that these, these uh, subjects have the same last name. So Constance will talk about her subject and how they were related. Hi, my biography is on Martha Hughes Cannon. The first question people ask me is, how are you related to her? <laughs> I am not related to her. <laughs> um, she was the fourth wife of George Q. Cannon's brother, Angus Munn Cannon. So that's how they are related. I started researching Maddie about 1973 when I was employed as an archivist at the Church Historical Society, as it was called then. And it was quite by accident I found her. The, the letters were filed under her pseudonym rather than her real name. And it took a little bit of research and I've, it was not really very difficult to discover that the Maria Munn of the letters was in fact Martha Hughes Cannon. Um, and then uh, the first thing I realized was that she had been practically forgotten except by her family, her descendants. And the second thing was there wasn't much that you could find to read and find out about her. The famous story is that her son, and unfortunately it's true, burnt all her journals and letters and papers at her death, at her request. So I had a series of letters, which have been published as letters from exile, and newspaper accounts. So what do you do to research someone who's kind of been erased by her own hand in a way. I went everywhere she ever was. And by a series of happy accidents, I was able to find out quite a bit about her. Then mysteriously, a series of letters she had written to her friend, who was at the National School with her in Philadelphia, <coughs> appeared at the Church History Library. Um, I later found out that her family had donated them. and. Uh, Really, that's all there is. And it's amazing because I have read the papers of every Canon family member I could find, um, the journals and letters of leading Mormon women like Emmeline B. Wells. No one mentions her. Abraham H. Cannon is the one who mentions her the most. And that is in relation to her courtship with Angus and her being the Cannon family physician. So it was very difficult to piece this together. And when Gary suggested I do that, I was thrilled, but I was a little bit overwhelmed, partly because I was living in China at the time. Okay. I could hardly race into the historical department to find things, but it worked out. And um, I, I think that she was a remarkable woman. She was a difficult woman. Many people loved her, many people couldn't stand her. And that's possibly why there's not so much to be found about her. But what, what we, I did find out is fascinating and I'm happy to share this with you all. Didn't she also ask her son to burn all of her papers upon her yeah. death? And, yes. and that's also a reason we have so little mm -hmm. in terms of documentation. Right, when you go to write a biography, the first thing you look for are the letters and the journals. They don't exist. It's too bad. All right, next, Gary Berger will talk about Harold P. Lee, and he also has a statement that Newell Bringhurst, the author, shared with us, so he will be reading that. So, I, so this, um, uh, Newell's little biography of Harold P. Lee was the first one published in this series, so it kind of was the, it broke the ground for, for, for this series of books. Uh, and Newell did send a brief statement. I, I just went through it and cut it by half, so with apologies to Newell, um, and this is Newell writing. My lead biography is akin to my earlier Brigham Young in the Expanding Frontier, completed some 35 years ago as a volume in the Library of American Biography series, 
under the editorship of the renowned Harvard University historian Oscar Handlin, whose careful guidance proved most beneficial. The writing of the Harold B. Lee biography was the major focus of my energies throughout the pandemic year of 2020. In fact, I jokingly referred to it as my pandemic biography. <laughs> in crafting the biography, I relied exclusively on information contained in two previously published lengthy biographies. Uh, Brent Goetz's Harold B. Lee, Prophet and Seer, and Francis Gibbon's Harold B. Lee, Man of Vision, Prophet of God. Both Goetz, Lee's son-in-law, and Gibbons' as secretary to the First Presidency, produced what could be called authorized biographies. Thus, both authors enjoyed unlimited access to Lee's personal diaries and other unpublished writings, significant portions reproduced verbatim in their respective biographies. These proved most useful in my own work, providing enlightening insights into Lee, the inner man reacting to the crucial events unfolding around him. Also providing valuable information and insights were the published writings of Lee himself, specifically his sermons, as contained in three published volumes. I also utilized two important oral histories by Lee family members, daughter Helen Goetz and son-in-law Brent Goetz. I obtained additional information from a collection of Lee's personal correspondence acquired by Provo-based rare book dealer Reed Moon, which he generously shared with me. The biography itself focuses on Lee relative to his impact on the LDS Church, in particular his unwavering devotion to church service within the broader context of his life experiences and multifaceted personality. Indeed, an understanding of Lee's complex personality provides enlightening insights into both the man and his ability to achieve. Most basic was his extreme intelligence, evidence from his youth as uh, from his youth on as reflected in his record as an outstanding student, talented music, musician, and skilled athlete. A second characteristic was, was Lee's compulsive urge to excel in all things he did, driven by his anxious desire to always be engaged in some useful activity. A third important trait was his quick action-oriented disposition. A final, albeit less positive, attribute was Lee's fiery temper. This characteristic, frankly acknowledged by family and close working associates, was tempered by the fact that such outbursts tended to be of short duration and did not result in lasting grudges. Notwithstanding Lee's brief tenure as LDS Church, as LDS Church President, his legacy was profound in both the short and long terms. Correlation, or the, the Lee Revolution as it was called, represented a major step in the quest of a modern church that could enforce a sense of orthodoxy and obedience. At the same time, correlation helped accelerate the process of carrying the message of Mormonism abroad. But correlation, as noted by LDS sociologist Armand Moss, tightened the screws on a potentially errant church membership, <coughs> ultimately producing a standardized and sanitized instructional curriculum wherein intellectual inquiry was eliminated from church education. Indeed, correlation reflected Lee's basic conservatism, both theological and political, underscored by his preference for centralized leadership and control, along with an emphasis upon unquestioned obedience. Lee's conservative ideals were perpetuated through his active mentorship of those leaders who followed him into the Quorum of the Twelve, most especially Spencer Kimball, Ezra Taft Benson, Howard Hunter, Gordon Hinckley, and Thomas Monson, each of whom in succession followed Lee as church president. In sum, Harold B. Lee was the right man in the right place at the right time, as noted with no little irony by liberal-leaning LDS historian Richard Paul, who candidly added that Lee would surely be remembered as one of the 10 most influential general authorities in the history of the church. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Okay, so Harold B. Lee is, is uh, obviously a figure that is well known in Mormon history, and, and Stephen Carter is going to introduce us to a woman who is not as well known, but should be well known, right, Stephen? That's my job. <laughs> I would be surprised if 1% of you knew who this woman is. The only reason I knew who she was was when I was in college. I read a book called A Little Lower Than the Angels, and it's stuck with me <laughs> for years, for decades, until Gary said, who do you want to write a biography about? And I said, Virginia Sorensen. And boy, was it fun. So she's actually the perfect author to pitch to you guys, because you're a bunch of history nerds, right? She's like the history biographer, or the history fiction writer. Her first book takes place in Nauvoo, but if you can't 
everything takes place in, in Nabu. What's really interesting is that her second, third, and fourth Mormon novels all take place in little uh, Utah valleys. Just after, like around 1910, 1920, times, times, times like that. And it was a really interesting time to live because your grandparents had settled the place, right? And your parents had grown up there and life was in these valleys. Mormonism was in these valleys. It was like hermetically sealed, but then the trains came in and suddenly you had a connection to the rest of the world. And she was coming of age just as that was happening. And so what she wrote about was being in this transitional space where everything you know your heroic grandparents and the history of the church coming straight down to you being a part of your soul and then finding out that there's not a lot of room left for you here in the valleys anymore. And the world is tugging at you and it looks kind of amazing. And what do you do? So she wrote novels about this basic tension that was happening to people in the 1920s, the 1930s and how they worked with it. And they are extraordinary novels. One, because she was an extraordinary writer. Her, her characters are just so memorable and exquisite, and you come to love every one of them, even the most hateful ones. You understand them all. If Virginia, if God is anything like Virginia, we're all gonna be fine. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's, that's, that's one of the things. And, and the other thing is to realize that Virginia was writing in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and she was writing novels that resonate so much with what's going on right now in the very polls that we're feeling, you, you know, when the internet got its hooks into us and we suddenly started seeing outside of <laughs> correlation, right? <laughs> And so you see the base, the same basic tensions, the same basic pulls at the soul. And the really interesting thing is she, she, she grew up in, in, in Manti. She was best friends with the Mormon, with, with, with the bishop's daughter. She loved church, but her mother was a Christian scientist. Her father was a Jack Mormon and her grandmother was a self-professed apostate, which freaked her out. And so she was able to hold all of these things in tension and find their beauty. You're so lucky. You are at the beginning. You don't know Virginia Sorensen stuff yet. And this is an exquisite rabbit hole because not only do you get to go down. <laughs> rabbit hole, whatever. Okay. You get to find it. You, 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 you get to read these novels. <coughs> and she also had this ethnographic eye. And, she, and, and you get to find out about the local color in San Pete County, the folk tales, the hymns, the songs, the memories that are all part of these stories. And when you read uh, Many Heavens, you get to hear about early Utah medicine. So you get all of this in these extraordinary novels. So that's why I wrote this book, was so that I could persuade the world to start reading this woman's amazing novels, and two of them are available as ebooks from Signature, and they have promised me, with hands over Book of Mormons, that <laughs> the evening in the morning is coming out as an ebook soon, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We'll talk about it. Sure. <laughs> All right. That's my introduction. Okay. Next, we'll have Gary Topping talk about our last subject tonight: D. Michael Quinn. This little book that's sitting in front of me here has an amazingly colorful history, and I have time tonight to tell you only a tiny part of that. I've never had quite such an adventure writing a book as I did with writing this one, and uh, so um, it, it's a book that uh, almost never came into being. And in fact, if it had been left up to my initiative alone, it would never have been written. Uh, one day I received an astonishing email from Gary Bergera informing me that Signature was starting this brief Mormon Live series and would I be interested in writing one about Michael Quinn. And my eyes must have gotten this big around as I was looking at my computer screen. I thought, Gary, are, are you, have you gone crazy? I'm not remotely qualified to write about D. Michael Quinn. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm not a Mormon. Uh, I'm not a historian of Mormonism. I haven't read any of Quinn's books. Uh, I, I knew Quinn very casually, just a little bit, and found him to be a very pleasant, likable fellow, but that didn't get me anywhere uh, near being qualified to do this. Um, and, uh, and also, there was the volume of the books that I'm thinking particularly of those three huge volumes on the Mormon hierarchy. Uh, just sat there like a brick wall. Am I, am I really going to do this? Uh, you know, I'm a Roman Catholic, but I don't care much about the Catholic hierarchy. Why am I supposed to care about the Mormon hierarchy? I couldn't get interested in this. So, but anyway, Gary was very persuasive. Uh, he had read the other uh, books on historiography that I'd written and apparently thought they were okay. And so he thought that I would be a good one to interpret Mike Quinn's books. And uh, he also pointed out to me that if you look at those uh, Mormon hierarchy books, they're about 50% footnotes, so uh, they, they might be uh, intimidating from the outside, but once you get into them, they're not that daunting. Uh, what Gary did not know is that I happened to be a footnote junkie, so I read all the <laughs> footnotes anyway, so I, I didn't really save me any time. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, so here we go. Uh, the only acquaintance that I had had with any of Quinn's work was I had a copy of his Mormonism and Magic book, and I had uh, uh, delved into it only deeply enough to realize that this was a work of real genius, of original research and interpretation. And uh, I guess I hadn't read it yet. I couldn't get work up enough interest in either Mormon history or magic to want to commit that much time to a very densely researched book. But anyway, I, once I got started on it, uh, I was in. Uh, I have to say that I had the time of my life doing the research, uh, uh, reading all of those books, even the Mormon hierarchy books, I, they just carried me right along. I just loved it. And as far as my lack of knowledge of Mormon history goes, it, it, that turned out to be not an obstacle. It turned out, I, I, you know, I've been living in Utah for 51 years now and, and writing Utah history during almost all that time. And Mormon history and Utah history are not coterminous, but they overlap at so many points that you can't do this for 51 years and not learn a fair amount of Mormon history. So I found out I was probably okay after all. <laughs> Besides, just reading Mike's books where I was a graduate education in Mormon history right there. So what I didn't know, I learned from Mike as I went along. So what I did, uh, I figured that since Gary had read my other historiography books, I would use kind of the same approach that I had used in them. So if you read the book, um, you will see that I start out with kind of a conventional narrative for the first several chapters, and then the narrative just ceases, and you've got a series of book reviews, and I have a chapter on each of his major uh, books. And then I come back in the end, in the end with a, a, a concluding uh, narrative chapter. So uh, I've, I've always thought that uh, uh, anybody who would write a biography of a historian is basically going to be writing about what he has written. Uh, we, we historians ordinarily live pretty humdrum lives. I, I, I certainly do. I can tell you that. And uh, so if we have any claim to fame at all, it's, it's in what we've written. Now, Mike Quinn, of course, is a bit of an exception to that because in the late 80s and early 90s, he became quite a cause celeb when he, was, uh, when he resigned his professorship at BYU and then was excommunicated from the Mormon church. Besides coming out as gay, all that's very colorful stuff. But, but that was only just for a, for a brief period, and, uh, and then uh, he became just another historian again. So anyway, that's the kind of what kind of book I've written here and uh, how I went about doing it. Fantastic. So I think you can uh, understand why we're so excited about this brief biography series. And they really cover not only these individuals' lives, but by learning about their lives and the times that they live, we can learn so much about Mormon history. Okay, so now I'm going to encourage discussion among our panelists. And I'm going to kind of go chronologically and move, so move this way. So we're going to start with the canons, who are our 19th century subjects. And uh, as Constance explained, uh, Martha Hughes Cannon was the sister-in-law of George Hugh Cannon. So the question that was natural for me to ask, I already know the answers, but I'm gonna ask them again so they can tell them to you, is what did they write about each other? What did you find in your research that they said about each other because they were brother and sister-in-law? So Ken and Constance? I'll, I'll start. My answer is the shortest. 
Nothing. <laughs> she did not mention that. Um, George Q. mentions her periodically in his diaries, uh, mostly because uh, his children uh, who were born to two of his wives were all delivered by Maddie. Okay. And uh, sometimes he'd have a party and say, my, my brother Angus uh, and his wife, Dr. Maddie Hughes, he always called her Dr. Maddie Hughes, because it never refers to her as canon. Um, because of polygamy in I order to protect I don't, I don't her from think, prosecution? So I, think I just think everybody, it's like everybody calls George Q, George Q, not George. And Dr. George Cannon, and that's not George Q. The middle initial is very important. Hmm. I think Maddie and Constance, you tell me, I think I think the middle name was a maiden name. Interesting, different maiden names for uh, Maddie um, was an important part of her name. Right, so he talked about seeing her at family parties, you mentioned, yeah, yeah. and delivering some of his wives, George children. Q's wives, children. Yes. And any particulars or anything interesting about that, or no. just the fact that he, she did it? Said, said Dr. Manny Hughes delivered, you know, uh, my wife Martha's baby this morning. That's, that's, that's what sort of what he said. There's okay. nothing there. Nothing I did, there. I did a search for Martha for, and there's a lot of Martha's in his life. For Maddie, there's, there are a number of Maddies in his life but they're not hard to figure out who's who, and he didn't talk about her much. Okay, and Constance, you mentioned that you found nothing in her writings about her well-known brother-in-law, George Q, is that right? No, she did not mention him, and in his letters to, in her husband's letters to her, he did not mention his brother either. Interesting. Um, the the um, Mormon authority who came up was John Taylor, and of course, Angus and George Q were nephews of George Taylor. I mean, John Taylor. And so his name came up quite a bit. So Maybe by John Taylor, Taylor, you mean the pres third the president Taylor. of the church, exactly. John Taylor? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So why do you think that she didn't talk about George Q? Do you think it was because, like, maybe she did mention him in her personal papers, which were burned? Or well, that's any possible, other reasons? But we so, can't know that. Yeah. All I know is that in her correspondence to her husband, what remains of it, what he saved, she did not mention him. Okay, all right, very interesting. Okay, so now um, we're gonna start moving left. Oh, Gary has a comment. Yes, I just wanna, can I ask a grab follow Grab the mic, please. <laughs> can I ask a follow up with Ken? Absolutely. So <laughs> Ken, do, do, does, does George talk about her as a politician? No, so, so one of the things I looked at, was the election of 1896 where Angus and Maddie ran against you? Well, not directly. There, there were three open spots. Six people ran for them, three Democrats, three Republicans. Three Democrats were elected. All the Republicans were not. They were at large uh, seats. And the interesting thing is in September of 1896, it was right at the time when Moses Thatcher, when George Buchanan was hammering down on Moses Thatcher and B.H. Roberts. You want to explain who they yeah, are? So, so Moses Satcher was an apostle who who didn't ask the first presidency to let him run for the Senate as a Democrat. And interesting, and, and George Q and Moses Satcher didn't like each other. And George Q by that point was a Republican. And so it's interesting whether it's an ecclesiastical issue or a political issue. But but Moses Satcher had, was at the very same time, was excluded, was booted from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, for refusing to go along with needing consent from the first presidency to run for office. B.H. Mm. Roberts, was due, who was a 70, was a general authority or junior general authority who was wanted to run for Congress and did run for Congress as a Democrat, also didn't ask for permission and got in trouble. He kind of reconciled himself to the more senior leaders. So this is all going on at this time. So Angus, who I, I should only mention in terms of transparency, is my great grandfather. So Angus is my great grandfather. His brother George Q is my great great grandfather, and their sister Mary Alice is my great great grandmother. I'm a direct descendant of two brothers and a sister, which is Connie, my sister back here, and I aren't that proud of that. But is this because of polygamy, or how is that? No, it's because of incest. Possible? It's because cousins marrying cousins. Okay, first cousins marrying cousins. Yes. Okay. Um, See, so we told you. And, and, that, and that was, and that was one, of, one of the allegations during the anti-polygamy campaign with the Edmunds Tucker Act. The Edmunds Tucker Act punishes incestuous marriages because there was this rumor that, that Mormons married each other. 
nobody mentions that Victoria and Albert, who were the queen and king consort of Great, of Great Britain, of the British Empire, were also first cousins. Really? I didn't oh, know they yeah. were first cousins either. Yeah. yeah, no, of course they were. And um, so so now I've gotten, now by by being way too transparent on my... So 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 Angus Angus is the president of the Explains Salt Lake State. Ang yeah, Angus is the president of Salt Lake State, which was a, an important role then. In the Salt Lake Temple, the administration rooms are the first presidency, the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, and the Salt Lake State presidency. They had their own office in the Salt Lake Temple. It was a big deal. It was it was covered the entire valley and was most of the. Anyway, so he was a state president. He goes to the first presidency and says, "May I run for office?" And the first presidency says yes. And you would have expected George Q to mention something that his wife was one of the people running against him. He does not. And he doesn't say a word. He says that the Democrats won, won almost everything, but he doesn't say a word about Angus losing or Maddie winning. Winning. Interesting. So, and, and he is recording. Sometimes he have, have lapses in his journal. These he, he kept a full journal through the election and he didn't say a word about Maddie. About or the Angus. woman winning. Interesting. It, it's interesting. Barbara, to know that in Angus's own journals, he does not mention anything about the election himself or his wife. So perhaps these men saw that as a humiliation. Angus certainly did. Wow. Well, of course he did. I, I have to say that my very favorite quotation from, and you can confirm, I found this in the San Francisco Chronicle, after, after Maddie won and Angus lost, she was interviewed, she kind of became the darling of the national press. And she was asked by a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle what it's like to be a polygamous wife and a doctor and now a state senator. And she said, her response was, if a Mormon woman's husband has four wives, it means three weeks out of four, she's free. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a long, I knew that quotation existed. It took me a long time to find it, but I did. And I love that quotation. Yeah. So, and, and Maddie is the darling of Utah today. The Utah legislature just recently voted to send a statue, a heroic size statue of Maddie Hughes Cannon to Washington, D.C. to be one of two uh, statues, two figures representing the state of Utah, which is kind of interesting when, because according to Constance's research, she was kind of forgotten. Sounds so, like the but, gets booted. so, yeah, she will be replacing Philo T. Farnsworth. So, so my wife's great grandfather, oh, my wife's grandfather's named Philo T. Edwards, who is Philo T. Farnsworth's first cousin, and so there was a kind of a smackdown discussion in our family about whether it should be Maddie or Philo. Or Philo, who won? Who won? Well, obviously the Cannons won. So <laughs> great. Well, I, I think I think it's great we have a woman representing Utah. Um, okay, so you all kind of brought in the subject of polygamy, so let's move to that uh, for our next topic. So polygamy, I noticed, is the thing that ties all of our, well, I'm not sure if it ties into Harold B. Lee. Gary can comment on that, but it certainly ties into four of our subjects here, um, connects them. So obviously we've talked about how the two canons practice polygamy. Um, uh, George Q. Cannon, the title, a subtitle is Apostle of Polygamy because he was, he was such a proponent of it. Um, but what's interesting to me is our modern subjects, Michael Quinn and Virginia Sorensen, their writings were heavily influenced by George Q. Cannon sources and also just by polygamy itself. So um, Gary, do you wanna talk about that? And then maybe Stephen can jump in. And then Gary Bergera, if you have any thoughts on Harold B. Lee, does he tie into? I don't think he does. No ties. Okay, so we'll just have you two maybe just talk about Mike Quinn's work on post manifesto polygamy and how George Q. Cannon's sources informed that. Yeah, it was actually polygamy that got Mike Quinn interested in Mormon history to begin with. Uh, he was born with a very heightened religious sensibility and as a young boy had read the Mormon scriptures and the standard works and had indexed them and made note cards. He, you know, Mike never did anything but halves, but uh, uh, that was just the Mormon religion. And uh, uh, he didn't get, uh, really start getting interested in Mormon history until he was a student at BYU. And uh, one day a, a friend of his came uh, boiling out of a religion class, uh, just absolutely irate. 
and complained that the professor had indicated that his grandfather, who had entered into a post-manifesto plural marriage, was an adulterer. And he was just irate that, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine the insensitivity of that professor, but you know, it happens. And, uh, but this kid was just really uh, uh, irate about that. So Mike, I don't know what, whether he said much, but he kind of took that up upon himself as a, as a personal assignment. And so that weekend that he got on the bus and came up here to Salt Lake to the old uh, Genealogical Society Library and looked up this guy's wedding and found out that this was a temple marriage by a duly constituted authority with the full blessing of the church. The guy was no adulterer. And so he was and able it was to go Samuel, back. Samuel W. Taylor, I believe. Uh, Is I, that don't right? know. I don't know. So uh, he was able to go back and tell this kid that uh, that was uh, uh, the case. But uh, Mike didn't talk much about this encounter, but you can almost see the wheels turning in there, him wondering, well, I wonder what they're, what else they're lying to us about, you know? So he, so, so that got him interested in polygamy and it was an ongoing uh, thing of his. Uh, and of course that um, uh, famous dialogue article of, uh, in 1985, uh, almost 100 pages long, detailing case after case after case of post-manifesto polygamy, uh, that was the article that actually kind of cooked his goose at BYU. Uh, when that came out, he was told that one of his department chair or his dean or somebody, don't do any more of that stuff. This is too hot for us, and uh, we don't want you to write about that stuff. Uh, so he just realized uh, that uh, he, he was done there. Uh, that's where he started calling BYU the Auschwitz of the mind, and, and uh, wasn't about to, to uh, uh, put up with that anymore. And uh, so, but he continued to research polygamy, and he, at the time of his death, he was working on two more books on uh, both uh, pre-manifesto and post-manifesto polygamy. That's right, and can, maybe the two of you could talk, uh, uh, Ken and Gary, a little bit about those sources, uh, why George Q. Cannon's sources were so key to understanding post-manifesto polygamy. I don't know if you want to jump in with that, Ken, about the... George Buchanan is, a, is, a, is the central figure in post-manifesto polygamy, I, in, in my view, uh, which is interesting because he was a guy, he was the puppeteer who pulled all the strings that resulted in, the, in making Utah State. I mean, he is clearly, I think historians are pretty unanimous that if you named a person who is the father of Utah State, that it would be George Buchanan. He did the deals, he told Congress that the end of polygamy was coming uh, months before the manifesto. Um, but he also called himself an ultra, by which he meant that he he believed in polygamy down to down to its core. And it's really too bad because it's he was really an, an interesting guy, and polygamy was kind of very much a part of him. But it was something. There were other things that were interesting that weren't quite so icky. Uh, uh, he was the person who came up with the idea that you could send couples to Mexico and Canada and with first presidency approval, kind of clandestine secret approval to be married in, in, for marriage. And they authorized uh, church leaders in Mexico and Canada to, to perform Mormon sealings, uh, plural sealings, uh, uh, not too long after the manifesto. Um, by far the most notorious uh, post-manifesto polygamous marriage was by Abraham Cannon, which was a kind of the favorite son of George Q. He was a member of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. And in June of 1896, uh, Abraham and a woman named Lillian Hamlin, who would, had been sort of a younger brother of Abraham's um, girlfriend, and then the guy died, and Abraham married her, uh, probably in the Salt Lake Temple, in June, of, and as a plural marriage. Um, and it was very notorious, and then Abram died. You know, he got sick and died of, of uh, some dread disease within a few weeks afterwards. And so George Q was in the middle of it. He died, he died in April of 1901, sort of before the whole Salt Lake Tribune. Another son of his was Frank Cannon, who became the editor of Salt Lake Tribune after he left the church, and, and was, the, was at the head of disclosing, of not disclosing, of unearthing, although he knew a lot of them, but it by his own thing. To, to show how controversial the practice was. Right. But, anyway. And then of course, uh, D. Michael Quinn unearthed <laughs> those yeah. sources. Um, yeah. uh, as a, a scholar of 
post manifesto polygamy myself. I relied quite a bit on Quinn who had access to uh, George Q. Cannon's notes and things like that. So we know so much about that subject because of Quinn and because of George Q. Yeah. Gary Bergeri, you had a comment. Yeah, I do. This is again from Ken. <laughs> um, so, so Quinn, yeah, Quinn did have, I mean, he, he, he didn't leave any stone unturned that he could find to document post-manifesto polygamy, but I don't think that he had access to the George Q. Cannon journals. Can how would that would would the journals have have added significantly Not, to what Quinn had done? I, I have read a lot of his journals, uh, and and there there are fifty one years of them, so that's not a it's not a small task, and they're detailed. And for the last fifteen or twenty years, he he dictated them, and so when you dictate, you do a lot longer. I mean, they're long entries. Uh, there is some information, but there's not that much information. I mean, there's not the kind of you know, he doesn't say, oh, and we came, I came up with this idea where I send people down with a special <laughs> recommend and we have to send down a separate letter and the, and the yeah. state president of Mexico has He doesn't write to, about it. We just he, have those letters, he, right? He, he we doesn't, have we have the letters, but we yeah. don't, he doesn't talk about that in his diary. Yeah. He does not. Yeah, which makes sense because it was so also secretive. Okay, Steve, uh, Stephen Carter, back to you. Will you tell, tell us how polygamy informed Virginia Sorensen's writings? So Virginia kind of started out her marriage in a quasi-polygamous way. She had two children, and after her second child was born, it really took a toll on her, and her mother-in-law lived nearby, and she came over to help them out, give her a chance to sort of rest up. And her mother-in-law had a master's degree in like that period's version of home economics, maybe it was home economics but she was like the world's most practical person. <laughs> and she was also completely different in temperament from Virginia. You know, complete practicality, pioneer stock type of stuff, while Virginia was kind of dreamy and romantic. And so she later said that um, having two such different women in the same household, you know, with their auras clashing against each other was kind of what gave her the characters to write about in A Little Lower Than the Angels, which is where the main character, Mercy Baker, has her 10th child and her body gives out on her. She's going to die. She has a heart condition. And so her husband goes to Brigham Young and says, what should I do? And he says, well, I've got this lady named uh, Charlotte Levitt. You should go meet her. And she persuades him to marry her. <laughs> they get married on the boat back to Nauvoo. And she comes in and she saves Mercy's life because she takes care of the family, she puts the house back together, she trains her kids to not pee in the bed anymore, she, you know, she's a miracle worker. And uh, Mercy has no idea what the relationship is between <laughs> Charlotte and her husband until she gets pregnant. And then the whole family just kind of falls apart and it's terrible. And so the interesting thing about polygamy in this book is that, one, it saves Mercy's life. She owes her life to polygamy. Two, it destroyed her family. And that's what Virginia Sorensen is so good at, is to take things, these Mormon things, and show how they both destroy and give life. And then when Charlotte has her baby, a much softer side of her comes out. She becomes more of a human. And then in 1950, she wrote a, a Many Heavens, in which she pulls off a miracle by convincing 1950s America that polygamy can be really romantic. <laughs> I'm going to leave it wow. up to you to go and read that. I have it to try reading that one, I guess. Astonish you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Last question, and then we will open <coughs> up uh, questions to the audience for Q&A. <coughs> so I find it's really interesting looking at all these subjects here. Um, that while George Q. Cannon, and of course much later Harold B. Lee, um, remained stalwart Mormon leaders in Utah throughout their lives and centered in Mormonism, the other three subjects eventually find themselves either geographically on the periphery of Mormonism or in terms of beliefs on the peripheries of Mormonism and geographically on the peripheries of Mormonism. And those three characters are the two women and the gay man. Um, so I just wanted to 
ask maybe all of you to talk about um, how do you feel like maybe uh, these factors, gender and sexual orientation, led to, again, these straight, straight men to being centered in Mormonism and in Utah, while those who were female or gay found themselves on the periphery on, of Mormonism, even though Maddie Cannon, Cannon was always active, um, but she was still in, you know, outside of Utah and, and in California. So maybe we could just open up that can of worms and let you guys talk about it. <laughs> Gary, do you want to start? Because you have a, we haven't asked you a question you yet. You like a deer in Gary, the Gary Topman, yeah. Great. Deer in the headlines is right. Um, Mike, I don't believe, regarded his homosexuality as an impediment to his Mormonism. Uh, he said that he remained a DNA Mormon. If he hadn't been excommunicated, he would have been a Mormon until the end of his life. He considered himself to be so. Now, after he and Jan separated, and Jan being his wife, uh, yeah, eventually divorced, uh, he remained celibate. He was uh, not sexually active. And so he didn't see that he was doing anything that the church would prohibit. And um, uh, so uh, that's that. <laughs> he remained celibate for a time. <laughs> um, yeah, that's but, true. Yeah, he always, um, from the time he was nine years old, he always thought he would become an apostle. So he thought he would become a George Q. Cannon or a Harold B. Lee. But yet he found himself eventually excommunicated, of course. So. Am I next? Because he handed it to me. If you want to be, sure. Let's <laughs> talk about question? Virginia. <laughs> ah, yes. Why she found herself outside. I think it was partially because um, when she got married uh, to Frederick, uh, they moved everywhere. He was a very charismatic man, also a very stormy man. He could get any job he wanted, but it was hard to keep it. So they moved from college campus to college campus, and she followed him around. And I think that made it difficult to like get a connection with the congregation and really sort of feel like part of the award. And the other thing was, <laughs> he wasn't, he was drifting away from Mormon, from Mormonism fast. He, he was almost speedboating away from, from Mormonism and she sort of drifted at, after him. It was kind of funny, on the day of their marriage, they were upstairs in their hotel room at the, at, at, at the Hotel Utah, the reception was happening downstairs and they were going to go to it, and he takes his wife by the hand and says, let us go down. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was. <laughs> so anyway, that was that was one, one, one thing. And uh, the other thing is that even though in her life she did drift away from Mormon, she, she, she didn't seem to really need it in her life. And I think that was partially because even though she had really strong Mormon pioneer stock and she loved her ancestors and she loved their stories. She actually went to Denmark to research for six months to write her biggest book, uh, King, King, Kingdom Come, about Danish converts, which was basically the story of her an ancestors. She loved her ancestors. She loved Mormonism as a child. But, of course, like we already talk, talked about, her other members of her family were in all different directions. So I feel like she had she she felt like the world was a safe place and she could wander if she left the valleys of mormonism it was okay she would find her way to something good and she did but one of the interesting things is her mormon novels are absolutely her best work and i think it's because of the the rigid walls and the structure of mormonism the structure made her novels what they were her other no novels who didn't have that s structure just weren't able to explore her themes as beautifully. And so I think in life, she didn't particularly need it. In her novels, she absolutely needed it. Interesting. Gary Bergera, any thoughts so about I'm not, I, Yeah, it's, it's risky for me to try to represent Newell in response to this question. I think that what struck me in Newell's biography of Harold B. Lee is that I don't, at least the way that Newell writes it, there was never a time when Harold Beatty questioned anything. And I think that certitude is what kind of empowered his, his willingness to take on certain general authorities uh, when he had a particular program that he, that he was supporting. I mean, that was his program and he was behind it and I think that he felt uh, 
so strongly that uh, it, it, that his feelings represented what he was supposed to be doing, what God wanted him to do, that he just he didn't entertain any questions or doubts about what he was doing. He had that he was that kind of person, and and you know I don't uh, some of you may be like that, some of you may not be like that, but that's I think that's what kind of makes him special that way is that he was just so he could be single-minded and strong-willed and that fiery temper would would serve uh, his interests and and his programs so I you know he didn't he didn't really wonder about it. you know it's really interesting is you could say the same thing about D Michael Quinn right yeah. <laughs> he was certain he was very, you know he was very certain about what he was doing was right and you know telling the truth you know so well, that's, but that's... but again Quinn was not empowered and why probably a big part of that because he was gay and so he wasn't allowed to be empowered you know like yeah. he otherwise might have been Ken let's we'll come back to you Constance but I wanted to go to the other apostle yeah. <laughs> here um, what sure. was would you say that he was similar to how he lead that way why was yeah. he centered he he was life? he was um if he had a defining characteristic, I mean, everybody talks about him being the smartest guy in the room. He's the brains of the church. I mean, Wilfred Woodruff said the, smart, the biggest brain in the church is George Buchanan. Mm -hmm. um, Brigham Young spoke constantly. I mean, Brigham Young had him write all his speeches from, you know, uh, mid 1860s on. Um, but he was absolutely, Brigham Young talked lots when he would call him on things that George Buchanan was absolutely fearless and he was absolutely devoted. I mean, he, you know, he, he they made him the, the, the editor of the Desert News at the time, Johnson's Art, down in whatever the town is that was the Utah capital. Um, doesn't matter. Fillmore. Fillmore. Fillmore, thank you. He was made the editor of the, he came from San Francisco, they made him the editor of the Desert News. He's moving to Salt Lake after the army goes through and, and Brigham Young comes and gets him and says, gotta send you to the East on a PR mission. And, and, uh, he said, when can you go? I said, I can go right now. And he had he had two pregnant wives. They had a small child and everybody's totally disrupted. And he just said, gave him a blessing and said, I gotta go. And Brigham Young said, I knew you would go because you're absolutely devoted. And he was very confident. He was very fearless. He was very direct. And he was absolutely loyal to the church. Could we say the same things about Natty Hughes Cannon? I mean, you know, all these people are very smart, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you know, can, so, so, yeah. You can say the same things about Maddie Cannon. She said, my parents were Mormon and I am a Mormon. And she never wavered from that. And even though in some of her letters to Angus, it appears that she rails against polygamy, she never lost a testimony of polygamy. What she railed against was what she called, was a kind of polygamy she had to live. Whereas Angus's earlier wives lived what Maddie termed an ordinary plurality. In other words, they could live in family units and enjoy each other. She could not because of the persecutions. And that's what she railed against. She did die in Los Angeles in 1932, but her move to California was health driven and not religious driven somehow. As early as 1886, she was convinced that her health would be good if only she could live, as she termed it, at the level of the sea. And so she was. She went back and forth to California after you, the. Could you? I'm sorry. I just want to back up. Could you talk about her exiles, where she is? She flees Utah early on right. because of polygamy. Because she was a person in the news, a fairly prominent person. And of course, her husband at Salt Lake State President was very prominent. It would have been a feather in the cap of the federal marshals to have her on the stand. And she did not want to do that. One, she didn't want to testify against her husband, but she had delivered so many babies of polygamous families. She said, all of these children have little mouths that must be fed and I will not be the cause of their fathers being put in prison. And so she left Utah in 1886 after the birth of her first daughter and went to England. She was gone for three years. And after the birth of her son James in 1892, she went to San Francisco. After the birth of her ch third child, Gwendolyn, which ended her political career. Um, 
she was back and forth to California seeking good health again. Um, her, her health was complicated. Probably if Prozac had been available, <laughs> it would have helped. She yeah. just was, she was depressed, she was anxious, she didn't know how to reconcile those things within herself. Hey, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>